think it's been good to have people talking on podcasts and stuff as well. Like, I think I've listened to more podcasts with people in bands because of that. You know, because I can't go and see them live. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm still interested in what you're doing, but like, can we? Can I listen to you talk about it? <laughs> it's a nice format as well, the kind of long form thing. Mm, yeah, I agree. I agree. Kind of gives you. I don't know. I feel like with an interview, you're kind of quite restricted. You've kind of got 20 minutes, fast, fair questions. You've got a, especially if you're speaking about a record, like you've got so much to kind of pack mm. in. Mm. And to talk about it in 20 minutes can be a bit tough. Yeah, I think, I think, I think the, um, the podcast format just, I don't know, it's conversational, isn't it? So it just becomes yeah. a different thing, I think, rather than like, and I think when you remove the idea of a, sometimes like a camera, you know, I think people are sometimes a bit more willing to kind of, I don't know, you, you, you just get a different side of people, don't you? You notice that when you turn the camera on, like when I'm doing the filmed ones, when you put the camera on, people change from before it. Yeah. Like completely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the mm. same, though. I did a couple of things over Zoom, like we music conferencing things recently, and like I'm not good, like, especially when it's a camera through like this and you're, you know, miles away, it's even weirder. It's really hard, I think. I think... I think the just by the nature of like being able to see people, like it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same as having a conversation face to face. Yeah. Like pro- proximity and space and all of those things. You know, this is the next best thing, but I think it definitely isn't. It certainly isn't the same. I certainly don't feel it's the same. You know. It's gonna be weird when we do all go back into rooms, though. When that does. I don't know how. I don't back. know how I'm gonna deal with it. I think I'm gonna be terrible. Yeah. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to like. I think it'll take me a while to like adjust back to like being normal. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> not that i probably ever was normal before but you know what i mean like you know it's it's yeah i think it yeah it will take me a while to be like how do i socially interact with people like what are my social skills did you like get a break from it all because i think england's been a little bit looser than up here hasn't it yeah but like we've been pretty we were really strict and in a way I, you can't you can't be you can't beat yourself up about it but like you know i didn't i didn't go in a shop from march until the end of august we we were just were being really really strict and then obviously the end of lockdown happens you see all these people doing this stuff blah 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 we managed to get one thing away which is where we went to my sister lives in cornwall so she's about to have a baby so in october before the second lockdown we did manage to spend a week down there seeing kind of family just got in that little gap yeah which was really nice and you know it's the countryside it's lovely but i don't know it's a hard one to say as well though because i'm in a different position to a lot of my friends you know i live outside london with my wife and my son and most of my friends are either in a relationship or single but live in london in a flat you know and it's you just have a different experience you know i can you know i live in the suburbs and i can drive like 15 minutes and kind of be in countryside you know and it's like that's good for me if anything this pandemic has made me realize that i just want to live in the middle of nowhere <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm a, that i'm a grumpy old bastard <laughs> that's what that's kind of where i am at the minute i'm like right i mean i'm probably about right on the edge of like a four thousand person town like kind of just out of right. it maybe yeah, half yeah, a mile yeah. out but yeah you walk like half a mile in the other direction and you're into the back yeah. of beyond and, and how is that do you do are you like do you like that yeah now and again <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm usually in glasgow but then i've ended up coming back up with a hippo because i just shit that's happened with a new lot down and um yeah 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 it's it's harder to readjust i think once you've lived in the city for a little bit i think i, prefer, I think i'm glad that i grew up in the middle of nowhere um as you know what i think i've i think i've gone i've gone i grew up in kind of the middle of nowhere as well Sim, similar sounds similar to well not middle of nowhere but like i grew up countryside to be in the country yeah countryside outside london you know it's 40 minutes from london it's not exactly it's not exactly like rural but it, you know there's fields there's forests you know and there's solitude to an extent and i think i'm i'm 32 now you know and i feel like i kind of I, there comes a point i love london i'll always love it i lived in london from when i was 18 i couldn't wait to live in london do you know what i mean it was like the thing i was like i'm going there you know i hate this place and you live there and then I don't know. There came a point like two years ago, just before we like moved out, and I was just like, "Yeah, I think I'm finished with it. Not finished with it, but like finished with living in it." You know, like I just can't. It just makes me feel. Um, it's just hard, isn't it? You need, a, you need a lot of energy for London. Like it's go, go, go all the time. I think also as well. I think yeah. I think it's just you know, like I was lucky enough to be able to like think of, be able to think that way, and like and have a level of like job security where I could like leave. 
you know, and go somewhere else, you know, not too far away and still keep a job or still be able to do the job that I do. But yeah, I don't know. I think I just got, I think I just got to a point where it was like, I just, I, I maybe I, maybe I pride my mental health over walking to a coffee shop, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. It's not for everyone. You know, half of my friends, I don't think would ever, ever leave ever no. in their entire life. No, 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 no. I think, some died in the wool Londoners. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, we digress. We digress. How old were you when you first moved there? I was eighteen. I moved there to um I moved there to study. I went to I went to art college. I suppose yeah, it's university. Art college sounds very old school. But yeah, so I went there to study uh, when I was eighteen, um, at a place called St. Martin's. It's like a big arts arts college, very famous for fashion, but I did I did for fine art. Um, but like conceptual fine art, <laughs> which is which is useful. <laughs> um, actually, it was. I'm being facetious. Uh, like I, I have to say, the fact that I could have access to an arts education. I, I, I don't come from a family of scholars or people that have. I was the first person in my family to ever go to university. You know, so like I think now I'm so thankful for the fact that I went to that university and studied at that university, got in and. At, at the time, I, you know, I could have grants and could, you know, the student loans weren't too crippling. Do you know what I mean? Like, but I, I honestly don't know if I would necessarily have gone to that university now. I don't know if it would have been a, I don't know. I was already thinking like, oh, I shouldn't go. It's too much money, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I do think, you know, it, you're thrust into a world when you're studying at a place like that, that's very different. You know, they teach you to think more than probably they teach you to like do things. <laughs> I feel like that's more that can be more useful in the long run, though. No, that's maybe like you were so. saying how you look back now and you think it was quite a good thing. It's when you're kind of grappling with maybe some of the. More... I mean, it doesn't help in the short term. And like, I I graduated in the middle of a recession, and like, I remember <laughs> so, I remember signing on, and like the woman at the signing on office was like, you know, like, what did you study? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> but. You know, obviously that was in the short term and, and, and I was lucky that I did have a support network of friends and people that, you know, we all got each other through and we found jobs and, you know, and I, and I did, you know, I had a great family that, you know, helped me and, you know, in terms of not necessarily financially, but, you know, being able to support, support me as, yeah. yeah, support me as, as a loving family, you know, as financially as they could, I suppose. I always knew I could go back and, uh, you know, work with my dad doing some building. <laughs> <laughs> um but he's a frustrated artist anyway <laughs> in what sense he's an artist and he's an artist in a builder's body that's you what think? he is yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 he's got the mind of an artist he just never has had the chance to use it as as proficiently i suppose oh, he's never been i wouldn't say encouraged but like this is gonna sound like therapy now but um i definitely think you know he he is an artist in the truest sense he's an original thinker like he he is someone that i can show something I can ask him to make anything, you know, I, you know, he just comes up with stuff and it's incredible. And it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a shame that he, well, not a shame, but you know, maybe he didn't, he gave me the opportunities perhaps that I, that he didn't have, you know, I think only when you get a bit older, I've become a dad recently as well. You start to realize that I think, you know, cause before you're just like a bit of a fucking, you know, <laughs> like a little amoeba, <laughs> a little, a little arty farty amoeba. So, but yeah, but anyway, that, that all got very Freudian there. Um, <laughs> but um, no, yeah, so I'm rambling massively. But yeah, I went and studied art and, and that was kind of, I was 18, moved, moved there. Yeah, I was there for a long, I only left a couple, a couple of years ago. And like I said, it's, it's a place that I love. It's, it's an alienating place. I don't also think it's a very good place sometimes to be an artist. It's the best and the worst place to be an artist, I think. It's a difficult place, you know? Was it quite a freeing art course or was it quite tightly structured no it was, it was very free <laughs> <laughs> it was very conceptual so so the way that it worked and i don't know if it works like this anymore was they would kind of divide you into i suppose like groups one per there would be the 2d group which is traditionally like painting and drawing which i thought would be i love making drawing so that was the thing that i thought i was going to be in you know like my thing did you draw from quite a young age yeah i'm a scribbler you know i love scribbling around you know it's, it's the quickest easiest way of getting thoughts out i often find and then yeah and then there was 3d which is like sculpture models you know all that kind of stuff and then there was 
4D. Ooh. I know. Wait a minute. <laughs> Which is basically like, I suppose, like video, sound, performance, con- anything that's loosely regarded as conceptual art. You know, like whereas like perhaps the idea is 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 uh, is more important than the product. And I ended up there, which was a bit of a shock. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really happy I did. It was it, it was very freeing and like a lot of the people that taught us, it was very um what you describe as kind of you know, the people that were teaching us, you know, the course was loosely based on a very famous course from the 70s. I think it's called the A course, which was this thing that happened in in like art what well, happened at some minds and then by extension happened at other arts education kind of institutions, where it was supposed to be this idea that like previously in kind of art history students had kind of copied their teachers so you know if you're a sculptor and you studied under a sculptor that sculptor would come in and be like this is my sculpture make work like that you know or make classical work or learn these skill sets which is very important but i think in the 60s and 70s there's this big break in kind of arts education kind of radical break where it was supposed to be kind of like very like autodidactic where people were supposed to like you know it's all about going internally and letting the students express themselves so the course that i was on was kind of an overhang from that it wasn't as extreme like the the course in the 70s was like they literally put all the students in a room for a week and locked the door and were like make work you know like make some work like and just like that's all you've got to do um mine wasn't like that <laughs> i think i think probably i don't know What's the university education equivalent of Ofsted had probably turned up and said, you can't do that. <laughs> but it was very much like some of the people that were teaching on that course had, had done that course, you know, in the 70s, you know, that they, 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 they had that spirit. So it was very much like, you know, it was very much about ideas and very much about like, um, this chair is a tree. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> this glass of water is the ocean discuss you know it's like you first get there as an 18 year old you're like these people are fucking mad (laughs) you think what are they talking about i don't know it's like it's like joining any kind of cult isn't it you soon get into it (laughs) i've not joined too many cults as it goes (laughs) yeah well i I guess not yeah sorry that was probably a bit glib bit but yeah it's um yeah that kind of mentality that thought kind of process starts to permeate you and and I think you don't realise it at the time, yeah. And I think like you, you're very astute, like you said earlier. You know, like you probably don't realise at the time that being taught think in a certain way is probably more important. And I don't know. That's why I'm so thankful that I kind of I'm not thankful. Maybe that's the wrong word. So I just feel so happy that I got to kind of experience that. You know, that that that, that a group of people are interested in what you've got to think about or challenge what you have to think about. And I think that that's something that can't be, I mean, that's a gift, isn't it? You know, that's the gift of education. I think more than anything. Was that the first time you felt like you'd been challenged in that way? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. I, 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 you know, my grandfather played a very large part of my kind of formative years. He was a, and he was a photographer. So we had this weird dichotomy in my family between a kind of very working class work aesthetic, and then a very, uh, a very like weirdly creative side to the family is this kind of weird balance, you know. It was it was very much about job, you know, like it was your life, but it was your job as well. So he was someone that really challenged me, encouraged me, and pushed me in lots of ways. I think probably at a time when my, you know, relationship with perhaps my dad, you know, my my relationship with my dad is brilliant now, but I think perhaps at a time where like you know he was working all the time you know to to support family so you know it does often skip a generation as well doesn't it once you kind of get into the teenage years a little bit i think so too i think so so i think i think but i think going into an educational institution like that do you know what the other thing is as well is that it's like you're no longer the person in the class that likes art and cares about art and there's maybe like one or two of you and you can do your own little thing and feel in your weird little teenage world superior (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> do you know what I mean like like you know like and I'm sure people have that about everything you know whether it's liking you know a certain kind of sport or a certain type of music I think as teenagers you're looking for things that perhaps it's a weird time isn't it you're either looking for things that make you fit in or things that make you stand out so I think that was a really interesting thing about going and studying art is that you're suddenly in this room full of people that like that's all that they care about and you're not special anymore in that respect like you know and you suddenly meet all these people that are interested in the same things as you and that's that's really important you know like i think 
I don't know, I suppose it's like that quest that never ends when you're a human and an adult human, that, that, that kind of search for kind of community, I suppose. That was very special. That was very special, I think. Um, that was kind of my time studying and, and it was great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Is that when you first started like screen printing and stuff or had you kind of done that before this point? Yeah, I mean as a designer and an artist and stuff and I think the thing about it was is that I had access to so many different things so like I think even now my work mainly moves across every kind of medium and I think that's probably because I was I was taught in this kind of conceptual way like I don't really care about I don't really care about the medium that the thing is delivered in if you know what I mean so like like if it's right that the thing should be a screen print or if it's right that it should be a video or it's right that it should be a song or some writing or do you know what I mean like I think I think that is kind of what dictates how I do things and I think I was lucky because it was the kind of place where you could be like right yeah I'd like to go and do some screen prints and there was a screen print facility around the corner where you could go and like sign up and do some screen prints or you would be like I'd like to make a video of this and there would be somewhere that you could hire a camera and bowl around for a week and you know it's video rain on a window (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like the most emo kid in the world you know and that is like that's like winning the lottery isn't it you know it's like to have access to that stuff you know you know I didn't have a laptop the whole time that I was at university you know because you know couldn't afford one I think you know it was a longer time ago I think maybe consumer electronics are a bit cheaper but <laughs> but you know it was and I'm not saying I was like rags to riches or anything but it just wasn't as usual to have that kind of stuff i think you know what kind of year are we talking i mean i only graduated like 10 years ago but i think even in that 10 years i think the way that technology kind of permeates our life has has, has... Well, there wasn't really iphones was it iphones were no, kind of what 2010 no. 2009 yeah so i graduated like beginning of 2010 so i started there at uni what 2000 late 2007 it's not like it's a thousand years ago but like it what it certainly wasn't like 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 my my experience of being in university like i think about it now and it's like uh, there wasn't necessarily like access to social media came in like probably in like my second year you know which was like the beginning of facebook and stuff like that and the way that we were using social media i think as a kind of formative young adult was quite different you know it wasn't it wasn't all the time it wasn't constant you know if i wanted to check a face facebook message i had to log into a computer you know it wasn't necessarily like instantaneous so i think I think that was something that was quite special about going to a place like that is that you do suddenly have access to all this stuff. You know, I think it's why arts education is so important and it's arts education is so important for people that like, not just for people that can afford to go or, you know, like it is, it's a really special thing and you can't necessarily quantify the, um, the value of it. Do you know what I mean? Like you can't say, okay, this person leaves university and becomes a doctor or this person leaves university becomes an engineer this person leaves university becomes an artist that makes 30 pieces that will get sold you know it, you can't quantify it necessarily by a kind of monetary value but i think what you can quantify it by is like i feel lucky to have met all the people that i met at university and still know and still keep in touch with you know they've gone on and done amazing things even if it isn't being an artist or a designer or a art director or a graphic designer or whatever do you know what i mean they, they, they've gone on and you know, work in art therapy or work in museums or write or not doing any of that stuff, even just, you know, working in an office, you know. I worked in an office for a long time, but I think maybe your arts education gives you a level of, like, thought about things. You know, <laughs> um, you know what you were saying there about how everyone's kind of gone off and done slightly different things? Have you had any conversations? Do you think it still kind of sh- has shaped your mind, that experience, in the same way? Like what you were saying about how it kind of taught you to think about things in a slightly different sense? What, in terms of the different things that people have done? Yeah, do you think it still kind of impacts everyone in the same way? Like, do you think you all kind of still have that thought process that's kind of carried over? I don't know if you've spoken I mean, about it with anyone. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say, obviously, not not necessarily, you know, being inside other people's heads. But, you know, like my brother-in-law I went to university with my some of my best you know four of my best friends I met at university and I, I think we still all think in the same way about things they're still the people that I knew at university if you know what I mean they're still they're still the people that think in the same way we still have the same stupid stupid boring arty conversations <laughs> you know it's um they can be some of the best conversations though. they can be they can be some of the worst too man <laughs> especially if you're listening in and you're not part of them fucking hell 
<laughs> like a load of old rubbish. But um, you know, it's it's how we talk to each other. So you know, it's it's, it's I'll let I'll let them off. <laughs> yeah. When did you discover? Is it Julia Margaret Cameron? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh man, she's amazing. Yeah, quite a big influence of yours. Yeah, I mean, I think that was at art college, but like she's she's like that. Her work is incredible and a complete pioneer and a kind of forgotten pioneer, I think, in lots of ways. One of the first photographers, really, isn't she? Yeah. 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 And like, effectively, a kid. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's. I mean, yeah, just incredible. Like the work is incredible and looks. I mean, if you were taking that work, you know, taking those shots now and putting them on Instagram. The, the 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 feeling and the subject matter and what she's talking about is so modern still it speaks through the ages and i just i don't know i just find it i find it very inspiring when photography kind of can capture something like you know it almost captures like humanity at a kind of such a uh it's like humanity plus you know it's like it's like those things speak in ways like an image can speak in a way that like is so profound i don't know i yeah i I think her work just is amazing. Yeah, she's she's a, she's a big influence. And then I think another person at art college that I I really resonated with was a kind of Dutch conceptual artist. Uh, he's called Bastian Arda. His work's really interesting because it's it's very it's like very melancholic, but it's also very funny. And it's all about like it's very conceptual. He he had a whole piece a whole series of images called where he was basically he basically throw himself off things. So like there's an image of him sitting on a chair on top of a bungalow. Uh, where he just like throws himself off the roof. Um, it's all like incredible physical performance, almost like Buster Keaton in a lot of ways. You know, it's like, but it's like, and he just took photographs as he was falling. Yeah, so like he'd set a camera up from across the street and then just like have it on a timed release. You know, bang, 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 bang. Or like, there's another one where it's a video of him cycling around Amsterdam, and just halfway through the video, he just goes full pelt in on his bike, just into the canal. <laughs> <laughs> or there's another one where he's hanging on a branch above a above a river with his arms and it's a durational kind of piece and it's either like is he gonna lose hold of the branch is the branch gonna break and obviously he's there for like 20 minutes holding himself up or you know 15 minutes and you're just watching this guy progressively get weaker and weaker and weaker until such point as he falls in the river and that's the end of the piece but it's all kind of like it's all quite slapstick in a way it's like watching a kind of like slowed down Buster Keaton film or something or, or, or Laurel and Hardy it's a, again about like about being a human isn't it it's like it's all about like tension and um release and movement and tragedy being so close to comedy and all of those things so yeah I, I he was another big influence on me when I when I was when I was studying certainly and I think continues to to, to be so like or he almost kind of wraps up something very, very profound and something very, very stupid. <laughs> Which, you know, I think is a good place to be. <laughs> How long ago was he? When was his kind of age? He was, um, gosh, when would that be? 1970s. He actually passed away filming one of his art pieces, uh, which is called In Search of the Miraculous, which is kind of, I suppose, prophetic in the sense that, you know, it was all supposed to be about this kind of romantic quest for this thing that isn't 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 achievable, and you know he he goes off on a boat across the Atlantic to try and find the miraculous. I mean, fucking hell, I am sounding like a nineteen seventies art <laughs> shooter now. But he his, he never was seen again. His boat washed up on the coast of Ireland, and that was that. It was never seen again. You know, I suppose the myth totally plays into the the narrative he built around his work but uh it's life imitating art isn't it it is imitating life imitating art <laughs> it, goes back and forth. <laughs> it does yeah yeah but yeah so he, yeah i think i think i think people like that have been very like i don't know and 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 those people are also about storytelling which i think is very important for the way that i work in 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 art and and across music and with musicians it, a lot of it is about the kind of unseen narrative if you know what i mean you know, and I think that's the thing that I find really engaging with working with musicians, especially or working in the creative arts or writing songs for my own band or whatever. It's 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 about all the things that you imply, but don't necessarily say that's that's something for me. It's those concepts, you know, it's it's working around concepts. Kind of like the is it Stefan Mochi? Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, Stefan Mocchia, yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. way you kind of yeah. you're playing around with this idea of the frame and you're kind of pulling back the camera a little bit and peeking behind the curtain with the set design and stuff kind of creeping in yeah, the edges of it yeah very much that man and 
again he that was a that was a project that's that's quite different to a lot of the kind of projects that i i work on as well like he is ostensibly a kind of modern contemporary classical composer he is a songwriter as well but you know the way that he expresses himself artistically is through piano you know most of the stuff that i'm working on is you know either pop or rock or you know that kind of stuff so it was it was it was a really interesting and engaging and rewarding project to work on because we were looking at how do we bring those sensibilities and and that and that feeling and that storytelling that happens through kind of i suppose contemporary pop music into a space that doesn't necessarily always have that if you know what i mean like i think a lot of kind of contemporary classical music perhaps often relies on like mood you know it relies on here's an image of a beautiful ocean you know here's an image of a deserted beach here's an image of a mountain you know just because that's become the established aesthetic narrative so i think with him it was quite interesting because th- that artwork places him in it without him being in it if you know what i mean um that 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 room is supposed to represent his kind of like it's supposed to represent his kind of like room that he makes stuff in which is a real room that he has in his house in los angeles but we kind of remade this space but you know the walls are gone and it's and it's it's a film set you know it's this implied narrative of like someone's walked in or walked out or something's gone wrong or there's part of a story you're not necessarily knowing so yeah, so I think that's the stuff that's the stuff that gets me out of bed in the morning, man, is like when I can make album covers or album campaigns or you, you fully frame and fully articulate something around the music that helps the music get listened to in a certain way or, or consumed or understood. Yeah, so we're drawing people in. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and, and I'm, I'm very lucky that I get to work with artists that really want that as well, you know, and really understand that. And hopefully see that in me and my approach as to how I work with stuff, you know. They're always the most fruitful relationships where you're kind of collaborating in that respect. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I love. <laughs> how, does, uh, how does that work when a collaboration is done over, you know, several projects? Like you've worked with Sports Team quite a few times and you've done a lot of stuff with Sigrid. Does that collaboration kind of evolve and change when it becomes a more long-term process? Yeah, 100%. I think... I think that's where it becomes most interesting in lots of ways because you you build up like a common language, don't you? Like, you know, not only just as colleagues or as as individuals that know each other and know each other's personalities, but but also a kind of shared artistic language. I can kind of present stuff to people, present things to people or talk to people or understand where people are coming from a lot easier you know as as our relationship progresses and 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 certainly they can with me as well I think and understand the processes that I go through so yeah I I love I love those kind of processes where it is there's a there's a length of time and you get to a point where you just ring each other up and you say I saw this thing or even if it's just a catch-up to be like how's your family or like you know how you find them writing a new record or what are you up to you know so um yeah, that you know, because it all feeds into the work, doesn't it? You know, the the work is about trying to communicate stuff that can't just be spoken about. The same way that songwriting is, the same way that any art is, I suppose. So yeah, so I, I I think those relationships really are fruitful, and and they're all different as well. I think as well, you know, it's it's that's the other exciting thing. There's no kind of set formula to it. There are things that I do and the ways that I work that I kind of bring to each project, just because they're kind of coping mechanisms for me or things that I find useful but the way that I work with a band like sports team or a artist like Sigrid or uh, you know any other of the projects that I work on they're very different to each 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 project because each person has something different to say you know and I suppose you you as the kind of person that helps them with the visual side of that the designer or the art director or whatever you bring yourself to that process and you bring your own thoughts and styles and working practices to it but you also um you're like a big coffee percolator (laughs) do you know what i mean yeah it's like a big melting pot yeah you let it kind of kind of kind of percolate through you and 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 kind of help them pick out the strands of their thought process and maybe maybe of surprising to towards them or or show them something they hadn't seen before or reinforce something that they believe they just need to be told you know this is good you know you're onto something you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so um yeah it's it's always an exciting process does it feel different when inspiration strikes you 
for something that's you know your own kind of personal project and when inspiration strikes you for something that you're working on with someone else in a design way yeah I, I would say so i think you know the thing about a personal project like be it the music and the band that i play in or the the artwork that i make for myself you are ultimately not accountable to anyone other than yourself you know in terms of those decision making processes so you, you can do what you want and when you are working with another artist you are accountable to I think a, a bit of a higher cause in a way. That's not to say that you like you 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 lose yourself or you don't present the things that you think are right. You're in a partnership that's about something more than you. I think you know it is your work, but it but it also is someone else's. You just have to be mindful of that, and that's not to say that it is. You know, I think that's the thing that's very difficult when you're when you're first starting out making work with other people or for other people is that the, the, the ego is is strong, <laughs> you know, uh, still within you as a creative because, you know, and, and that's hard to throw off because you, you do think, oh, this thing that I love is maybe the best route. You should do this because, you know, I love it. And actually it's something that you have to really try and kind of put aside and become quite objective about is that like, you know, you, you have to be able to kind of weather the, weather the conversations, weather the process and uh, and get to a point where you're like, no, okay, like maybe just because I like it doesn't actually mean that it is the right way to go. You know, like there might be all these other mitigating circumstances or th these perceptions or these thoughts. And so I think I think it is a different process. Yeah, very much so. At what point did that ego start to go? And it did become where you were kind of able to I mean, I don't... a little bit more clarity. It's a very youthful thing, isn't it? I think so. I mean, I think, I think, I don't think the ego ever goes necessarily. Like I'm, I'm sensitive about work, you know, ask my wife, you know, uh, at the end of the day when things haven't gone right, you know, she, you know, I'll sit there and really be upset or beat myself up or be annoyed, you know, because I think that's just human nature in terms of like, when you've put in a level of effort, you expect a level of reward, don't you? You know, in anything be that digging a hole in your garden for a fence post or you know <laughs> or, or or making some artwork for someone so you know so I don't think it ever truly leaves you but I think you have to really like try and try and be objective and try and realize that like you know there are so many other things at play all that you can do is you can you can bring yourself and bring your processes and for me I'm lucky that that's worked so far but I know that there will be certain projects where it won't necessarily work and I need to it's still an ongoing project for me personally in terms of my mental health and my rationale that like I, it, it, it says as much about the person I'm working with as it does about me. You know, we may not just be right for each other, like not all creative partnerships work. So I think there's that. And I also just think, you know, it's just experience and working with people and, and, and just being collaborator with people the more you do it the better you get it you know the the, the more you do it the more you realize that like no idea is sacrosanct and no, no one has a monopoly on ideas and also the more you realize that like if you've had one good idea before you'll probably have another good idea you know like <laughs> you don't need to hoard them or worry about who's necessarily getting the credit for them i don't necessarily mean that like don't be taken for a fool you know <laughs> people should know that you are part of this process but um it's just about that kind of letting go, I think, in a way. Is it ever harder to get, like, the design ideas out as opposed to, like, the musical ones? Because I'm thinking, like, the musical ones, you know, if you have, like, uh, an idea for lyrics, you can note it down quickly or a melody, you can mm. record it quickly in your phone. But does it come to you, like, as a full image or how do the ideas kind of differ in the way they arrive? No, I, no. I, that's not really the way I work either. I know lot, some art directors and designers and stuff will perhaps have an image that they wish to get to. But I think just the nature of the way that I am it's often about process you know it's quite therapeutic it's a lot of talking it's a lot of like discussion it's a lot of research which can be longer sometimes but that's how i tend to work you know and 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 so you know we'll get to a place where we'll know what the image is that we want but you know sometimes i like to leave it to chance to an extent as well and put a set of rules and parameters in there and and you know get to the day of the shoot and know what we're going to shoot but not necessarily know how it's going to turn out do you know what i mean i i there's an element of danger and risk that can sometimes be incredibly rewarding. I mean, it can sometimes be incredibly bad, <laughs> but touch wood that touch wood that doesn't that doesn't happen. You know, because you've had those conversations, you've been through a process with everyone, you've brought everyone on board and 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 spoken with each other in depth, so you all know what you're doing. So it's actually just an element of like going and doing it. 
but in terms of like speed i think actually like the way that i design and the way that i work is a lot is a lot quicker because it's a muscle that i have to be able to like turn on and off if you know what i mean like you know i have to be able to get on my computer at 9 a.m do some emails and then bang right these people need 30 ideas bang 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 you know and and you hope that the conversations and the ways that you've spoken about things and the research you've gathered that's all going on in the background you know that's all stored in your brain so that when you do have to turn on a computer and make 30 ideas it just comes out subconsciously yeah i would say actually in a way like the way that i design and put things down in that way is is relatively quicker like i think also because music i'm working collaboratively with three other dudes you know that that, that you know that, that all have an input and all have a say so all make certain parts of the music you know or it's a very collaborative process and we all do different things within that band so you know it's it's a very different way of working because you know it is a lot more of a like a batting things back and forward if you know what i mean it's not so self-reliant sometimes you know yeah i get what you mean though like the way you're speaking about it being a stream and you kind of leave a little bit of risk in there even like when you're doing a call like if you think of the sports team cover there's a certain energy that comes from that you can get that sense of the scrappiness that is kind of just flowing out and arriving that that totally was an element of chance to it in the sense that like you know rob the guitarist has very clear ideas of like what he wants the band to be and seen like and he he used to make all the art every bit of artwork himself and so my my my, my role there i think was just to kind of plug into that and kind of help him it wasn't about me bringing and that that cover is me you know that cover is my style and it's probably the way that i would work it's probably the closest way to the way that i would work if i was just making something for myself often you know i love that tactile nature and that tactile quality but actually a lot of that process was about me kind of thinking like well how how would rob approach this or what would rob do <laughs> do you know what i mean like it was like or what what has he done in the past and then kind of bringing myself to it and 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 kind of embellishing that as well so i mean i love that 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 was great and that was one of those ones where it's like you know you're up at midnight kind of on the kitchen floor with like you know that was a huge huge painting that i just made in my kitchen <laughs> you know you still got it uh, no we raffled it off to a fan but it was like a kind of two foot by three foot kind of painting kind of thing like a big kind of like collage that i just kind of pieced together and was doing bits and bobs and you know oh you know i've got this old postcard from somewhere you know in this drawer like i'll use that or like there's the top bit of it there's like a little orange slip at the top and that's literally from like a tree surgeon who lives down the road who put it through the door <laughs> who's steve. like do you need a tree yeah like literally like steve can cut down a tree there's part of a takeaway menu from like th four doors down or something do you know what i mean it's like <laughs> well i mean it works you know, with the like the kind of things they're talking about in that record though because that's kind of doing the brit poppy thing where it's so kind of rooted to where britain is culturally at the moment and you're kind of incorporating that by getting all those little scraps in well and also you know though it was really funny because it was like a lot of the time they've been kind of classed as this kind of in this brit pop kind of vein but actually the stuff that they were referencing the prism that we were kind of putting it through is like a lot of like 90s like seattle music or like 90s uh like stuff like pavement or uh you know things like that you know like it's very handmade you know yeah it's got that kind of slackery edge to it yeah yeah definitely definitely but i think that's where the interesting tension comes in that respect because because we're making something that looks like that but all the things they're talking about are about britain you know in 2020 you know so I, that was really interesting to me you know yeah, kind of taking that spirit of the Seattle music and then incorporating it into British culture. Exactly. That kind of, like, yeah, like you say, the tension. Yeah, exactly. What else stands out to you from that cover when you think back to the little kind of elements and scraps of it? Are there particular images? Because it must be weird for you looking at it because every image must have its own kind of meaning and rooting in your everyday life to a certain Yeah, degree. I mean, do you know what? What comes back to me when I look at that cover is the feeling of making that uh, that that cover. I remember I presented them a few things and it was like, they were good. And funny enough, I used one of them in, for my own band later on, <laughs> <laughs> which they were like, hang on a minute. But I was like, look, mate, you didn't want it. <laughs> but, um, but like, I remember presenting these things to them and, and we, I remember we went down the pub and we were all looking at it and they, they liked the stuff, but they were like, do you know what? Like, they were like, in a way it was like almost like a kind of this tacit agreement where they were like, 
like just just like do more like just it was almost this thing of just like bring more of yourself to it kind of thing and actually what i'll remember from that rather than the kind of specific imagery of of of, of what was created was the kind of feeling of making the the piece really which was like a really like you don't often have it with making art for you know albums sometimes you know you can be relatively analytical about your approach when it gets to that point when you're finessing stuff but i had this feeling of like of like being at art school again you know it was like this very like loose and that might be because i was making it very late at night <laughs> but you know it's this loose kind of feeling where it was like oh you know let's try this and put this here and match that up and scan that in and see what happens here and that was that was special you know and that was special when you present that and someone goes i fucking love this you know and you're like wow okay right yeah maybe i have been on something here you know <laughs> um have you ever had that feeling when you've been making music as well oh yeah you get that yeah. a lot making music i think i think we got that a lot making our record we, we kind of finished it in april last year and we did all of that ourselves probably the only thing of getting older and being older in a band is that maybe you picked up a few more skill sets than when you started. <laughs> so we were lucky enough to be able to kind of like be very self-reliant and very DIY and make the whole record ourselves. And like our bassist Nick produced it all and everything. And, but you, you, you do get that a lot, I think with music. And I think, you know, I, I, I sing in my band and I often get that point of like, I'd say it's almost kind of transcendental point where like when you get into a, the spirit of a song or the groove of a song or the feeling of a song that you kind of lose yourself in it and you become kind of more than yourself and i think that that is that is something that i find very much so with with when when we're making music maybe not so much in the kind of like analytical nature of it of terms of like you know the the, the lyric writing or the or the production side you know which i i can't do myself but you know when we're feeding back to to each other but certainly in the kind of performative side of the action of the thing, yeah, I think you 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 that you hit that often. It's kind of about not to rely upon a cliche to describe it, but it's about living in the moment, really, isn't it? Like it's quite tough to often be present, right? Like in the in the present tense when we live in a world that's kind of so plagued by kind of fear and worry at the minute, where everything's going. It's the only time I am present. Is it's the only? <laughs> to be honest, I think it's probably the only reason why I still make art is because it stops me from going absolutely loopy with hypotheticals that is why i make art really is to keep you on an even keel ultimately <laughs> it, it's a nightmare when it's not working out or you don't feel that necessary you know it's that it's that effort and reward thing sometimes is difficult and when i mean reward i don't mean necessarily success or monetary reward i just mean you know kind of spiritual reward as to whether or not you think anything you've made is good <laughs> um I think that's the only reason why I do it, to be honest. If I'm going to get, uh, again, once again, Freudian about this, keeps the horror at bay for a while, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> do you think being an artist, though, do you think that makes you think more about the past or the future? Like, kind of like with that time when you're living in the present moment? Both. Both. Both equally as infuriatingly. I love, I love everything in the past, but I don't know. It could just be me, but like, I, I think I'm a catastrophizer to an extent in terms of in terms of worst case scenario or things outside of my control, be that personally or politically or in in the world or with people that I love. Um, and then I think in the with the past tense, I think I'm certainly someone that I, I try not to stay still too long because I, otherwise I have to take stock of, you know, previous work or, you know, do you know what I mean? Which is the worst thing because you start looking at it and you start finding everything wrong with it. And I don't think it's always necessarily healthy to be present. You know, I think there's been a there's been a kind of uh, almost a kind of wellness radicalization <laughs> across the internet of like let's all be present. And and I don't actually all I think sometimes it is sometimes bad for me being present all the time. If you know what I mean, it, it, you don't you lose perspective. Yeah, you don't give yourself a chance to look at things or contextualize things or or even just give yourself a break from how you are feeling about work you know um or or feeling about art or feeling about yourself i think it can be very beneficial to both look forward and look backward we're speaking in january 2021 so maybe that, <laughs> maybe that should be my maybe that should be my new year's resolution in amongst the uh nightmare world we are currently living in <laughs> 
does it become easier to live in the moment though when the the studio kind of becomes your house and your home becomes a studio because you're basically living in your art at the minute you're yeah surrounded uh, by it. i wouldn't necessarily call it art i'd call it kind of detritus waiting to be made into maybe something that someone at some point the will, Debra. Uh, will term art I wouldn't be so presumptuous to say that my my scraps of paper and loose filings represent any kind of great artistic statement. But yeah, you know, probably again, talking to my wife who has to like live with bits of junk everywhere. But I think it's very, very difficult. I have to say, I think I need to separate it because when the domestic space also becomes your working space. And, and, and also the other thing is, you know, there are two strands to like, I think my artistic practice, which is the strand where I am working with and for other people, which obviously I do for financial recompense. <laughs> and there is also the other strand, which is, you know, my own personal work, which, you know, has varying degrees of success, be that spiritually, emotionally or financially. But, you know, so there are two different things to separate there. And the trouble is, I think you could live with that domestic space slash artistic space when it is just for you, you know, because it becomes an extension of your home life and you're, and it's who you are. And it's like, you know, your your house is a representation of you and your living space is that. But I think the one thing for me that I need to try and get better at is 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 separating those two strands and separating you know the 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 professional space because i think you know what can end up happening is you 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 end up you you end up living at work you're not working from home you know <laughs> it's like elon um, musk isn't it? he sleeps in his work i mean that man is a nightmare <laughs> he actually just, he got what was it he got named the richest man in the world today he's finally done it brilliant great brilliant <laughs> i mean just like you know whatever fair play you know if his technology brings help uh, to people, but I don't know, from what I can see of him, he's the furthest from altruistic that you can possibly ever get, you know? Um, so yeah. Do you know what? Maybe I'll get eviscerated by some tech bros on the internet for that, but you know, it's just like, yeah. I think he's, a, he's probably a net positive overall with the stuff he's kind of going to bring. Yeah. But then yeah. having a backup isn't a bad idea with what he's straight to them and electric cars and tunnels under LA and all that stuff. It's all, yeah, be but then I, uh, yeah, but then maybe I'm too. Uh, I, I don't feel that those things are necessarily altruistic. You know, like like they are obviously like a net good for the world. They stop pollution, but they'll like make them a lot of money as well. That's the thing. They make him a lot of money, and they also like, oh, let's privatize space travel. You know, like really, <laughs> is that the way to go? Is that you know, like like I don't know, like. I don't know. I'm always, I, I always get worried by that kind of stuff slightly, you know, saying that, you know, what have I done? I've made a few album covers. I haven't made a solar powered roof tile. So, you know, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was it, uh, was it easier to separate art and or work in the kind of home life when you were still working at Island and it was very much a job that you kind of went to a space to do? Uh, yes and no. I think it's easier to separate the kind of space, the physical space, but I think, working in an environment like that which you know was great and i learned so much and working in a in a in a label like that that has a level of heritage like that you know some of my favorite artists ever have put records out on that on that record label and you become the art director of a place like that and you know i was aware of that history aware of you know my tom waits and my bob marley's and my nick drake's and my grace Joneses to know that like you know i was being handed the keys to a what to a very expensive car now whether or not that car is still that car is another question but you know that divide was certainly um easier in terms of like a physical space you go to an office you work in your office you leave your office you come home the mental divide certainly wasn't and i think that is an issue that 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 has not necessarily been confronted by the music industry is is the the, the mental pressure that is placed upon its staff to be working constantly and to to believe that they have won some kind of lottery to be there. You know, I, th- I, I do think that is pervasive still. And I do think that mental health support for people working in the music industry, I think is getting better for artists. But I think a lot of people that, that work in the music industry do really suffer with the stresses and strains of, of that lifestyle and, and the expectation that you should be constantly working and you should also you know your job should be the only thing that is important to you you know uh, i'm not necessarily saying that that's implicit in terms of like what people tell you but like it's certainly the culture 
Everyone you know? feels overworked, like from PR people to bookers to managers to like. You it's see also yourself, the, like, it's also the culture that like you know that that like that like enables that. You know, it's the culture of like, and you know, look, I'm now on the other side of of it, being a kind of recording artist and putting an album out, and and also working as an artist for other artists. You know, and I've kind of left those kind of corporate structures and 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 feel out of remove from it. And I think a lot of people do that for their own sanity often, but you know, also do it because you know they want to perhaps be more independent or you know feel that they have a choice about things that they work on or artists they work with but yeah I, I certainly think that I certainly think that there was this expectation there's always a feeling that there, there'll be someone else to fill your shoes do you know what I mean like that like everyone's replaceable and 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 I think that that is a bit dangerous I think it's certainly changing I think there's a certainly like a younger you know I think as people move up the ranks from you know a younger generation you know, saying that some of the best people that I worked with at that label, you know, and the and the and the people that mentored me the most were were people that had been in the industry for a very long time. But I think certainly, you know, but then it's also hard because it's an industry that that also prizes competitiveness, doesn't it? And the people that run a lot of those labels are the most are the most competitive people. You know, the, like any corporate structure, it does encourage a kind of competitive spirit. So I think it's sometimes quite hard because like institutionally, how do you change work-life balance when the people who are at the top of it sometimes, I know obviously I'm projecting here, you know, I don't think all of these people are like that, but I think inherently as a structure, often the, the things that are rewarded are the things that are not necessarily healthy, if you know what I mean. Yeah, well, if I guess if you're in a corporate structure, does it then come back then the financial side of it, which isn't a great indicator for creative success? Yeah, it does. It does. Saying that, you know, I would say what well, the whole time I worked at a at label like that place, you know, like uh, I, I never saw people being forced into creative decisions that they didn't want to do necessarily. I think there was probably uh, there's probably like coercion or like discussion that, that was like difficult for artists and hard for artists and you know you'd have to talk to an artist that's been on a major label to kind of understand that i suppose uh, i can only speak from the other side yeah i think there are financial implications of that obviously you know like you say like it, it does reward financial success i think it's difficult as well because certainly again speaking on a personal level often my work was viewed through that prism you know some of the work that i think is most successful has not necessarily been the most um Su- successful in terms of units sold or reviews garnered do you know what i mean so i think that's also quite difficult for people who work in the creative industries within the music industry because you may feel that you've executed a campaign that's incredible but actually your campaign will only ever be judged upon the you know the success of that record so that's something that you have to kind of get your your head around quite early on as well that idea that you mentioned a little bit a little while back as well actually about you know people feeling like they've won a lottery to get to this position where they're in a job and they're mm. working in the music industry. At what point did you first feel that, and then when did you kind of move past? It? I mean, the whole time, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have I moved past it? Who knows? Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, in some ways, it's a dream. You know, it, like it, I, and I'm not going to sit here and complain about the fact that I work in this industry because it is incredible and the perks that you the 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 not necessarily the perks but the the experiences that you garner from it and the places and the people that you meet and the things that you do and the fact that i am making a living out of like effectively what was my hobby and my you know i, I will never ever ever denigrate that do you know what i mean like that is that is incredible and this industry has given me that opportunity uh the people that i worked with that a major label gave me that opportunity and i took the opportunity but I didn't have a traditional route into working in the music industry. Like a lot of people would know like, Oh, I, I do an internship or I do this or I do that. And I, I get here and, you know, I have to say as well, like the company that I worked for universal was broadly pretty good with internships. You know, it was, they're all paid for they were year long. They, they, they did take from a, a large sample size of people that like didn't just come from wealthy backgrounds, you know, someone took a massive fucking punt on me working at that label. Like I had basically fucking zero experience, but the person who employed me liked me. And I, I, I literally applied on a punt because I was like, 
I'd been in bands and suddenly I wasn't in bands anymore. I was like, oh, maybe I'll try working in a record label. I had no idea. <laughs> Did you interview for it? What's that, that process kind of yeah. like? Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed for it and it was hard, man. It was really hardcore. I was like, I think I went for like five interviews and it was, and also I was older than a lot of the applicants. You know, I only, I only entered the music industry when I was like 27. You know, a lot of people were going into the music industry at like 18, you know, and not doing uni and doing an internship and working your way up from there. So I, I was going in for an entry level job like a small like it was like a it was like for like doing like social media and like fucking like making some gifts do you know what i mean it was like and i was like well i can use photoshop <laughs> <laughs> you know and i can use photoshop and i can i can i've been in bands i know about music do you know what i mean and and oh i like island records i, I love king crimson you know that was my that was my that was my <laughs> fucking like knowledge of island records it wasn't it wasn't like you know, are they putting out a Nicki Minaj record or something? Do you know what I mean? It was like King Crimson album is a good one to be fair. First one, yeah, but it, but it, I, it is an amazing album, but it's also like not necessarily applicable to like landing a job, <laughs> <laughs> a major rate. Right? Well, maybe it was, maybe, maybe, maybe it was, but like, yeah, it, I interviewed for the job. Like, I applied through the kind of universal. You know, they've got like a job portal. So, you know, I'd always go on the, the, the music job portals and be like, oh, I'll give that a punt. I'll give that a punt. I was working in an office at the time, uh, doing something completely unrelated. What were you doing at that point? Just literally like office, kind of basically like office admin, uh, you know, and in the evenings working with, you know, I lived with my, all the guys. So the guys that I play in a band with now I've known forever, you know, and we've always played the music that we play now but just no one cared about it before. <laughs> <laughs> so I lived with all those guys and they were all doing different things. Some of them were studying, some were working in pubs, you know, it was all like, you, you know, we're young people in London, just, you know, Living doing life. your thing. Yeah, doing your thing, you know. And yeah, so I just applied for it on a complete punt and then I met an amazing, the guy that interviewed me first, he was the guy that ended up kind of giving me the job and I mean, he's just been an amazing mentor as the, the head of press at Ireland. And then I had to interview with a load of other people. But he kind of gave me the heads up that maybe I shouldn't mention King Crimson in the next interview. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was talking about, like, I don't know, the KLF or something. I'd written a I thesis about I thought King about Crimson had kind of got a little bit of cultural um, currency have, again after the have, Kanye have, sample. Yeah, They have got cultural currency, but, I, you know, I think working in a major record label, like, you know, you're all, that is a place that's always you know you're looking at your heritage but you're always looking forward because you know if you concentrate on your heritage too much then you might as well like close the doors and become a catalog label so you know i think if you were to mention that to to, to people working in that label like you know there'd probably be a lot of them who would have knowledge of the record or, or love it or whatever but like it's not necessarily top of everyone's priority list when you're talking about like so why do you want to join island records you know mentioning a relatively niche prog record from the late 60s early 70s is probably not not going to be the one that wins you the, the job <laughs> <laughs> well maybe it is maybe it is maybe it shows i don't know who am i to fucking advise anyone on anything well it shows you it shows you care about the label doesn't it as opposed to just kind of does. being caught up in the moment it shows you even appreciation for the heritage as well as what's going yeah, on i there. suppose it does i suppose it does and like I said, who am I to advise anyone on anything? Like, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like, and going back to the lottery thing. Yeah. I like certainly like, I think I've definitely, I mean, I've really worked hard and grafted and tried to make as much of my own luck as possible. And, you know, and know that I've been really gifted with being able to have a, have a good education that can help me do that, uh, you know, in terms of being able to go to art college and stuff. And having people that support me, you know, I know, I know, I know all of these things have fucking stacked the deck in my favour. But you know, I have, you know, I've grafted. But yeah, I think, I think there is certainly a kind of element that, like, I that there's like a, still a level of like semi disbelief that I, I do a lot of this stuff, and I think that's kind of important as well. I think there's a great like Brian Eno quote, isn't there? And again, this is going to sound like so pretentious, but he was talking about why he left Roxy Music you know, the height of their fame. And he said, I left because I was on stage one night playing a gig and I was thinking about like washing up or like like doing the dishes or doing my laundry or something. And he just thought, oh, I know this is, I've got to leave. And I think that's probably the same thing for me. Like, I, I think I still, I still do get a kick and an excitement and a feeling of like, fucking hell, how do I end up here? You know, like what the fuck, you know? And I think the minute that kind of goes or I feel that I'm entitled to it or, 
that I'm like special somehow, <laughs> I think is probably the minute that I should get call it a day. <laughs> was that partly why you left Ireland, or what was kind of feeling that decision? Just the desire to maybe get a little bit more freedom? Or... Yeah, I think so. I think I'd been there a while. I'd been there like five years, and I'd kind of reset up the creative department within the label. Like previously, there wasn't creative people that worked in the label. And then when I left, there was a team of people that, you know, commissioned videos and, and made stuff. And I'd been the art director there. And that was a that was a journey, man. And that was a real, I mean, it was a fucking trip. You know, it was great. And it was the hardest I think I've ever worked in my life. And I gave a lot to that record label. But I think I got to a point where I was like, yeah, you know what? Like, like maybe I can do this for myself or maybe not even do that, but like, just go and do something else and like you say like have a level of freedom and feel like i know and there was like exciting stuff happening in my life i just had a little boy and other people from other places were getting in touch you know like like other bands saying oh i really like your work with this or really work. and you know when you work at a label you can't necessarily be like cool yeah i'll go and do your artwork too because you know you're in house so i just felt like the time was right you know what i mean like it, it just it just felt right for me and i think I think I just felt like I needed also to feel like I I was learning stuff still, if you know what I mean. Not that I'd never stop learning at Islands, but like you do get to a point when you work somewhere for a long time that like, you know, you go through certain patterns and certain routines and there's a rhythm to your year, you know, there's a rhythm to your campaigns that you work on, you know, there's a rhythm to your interactions with people. So I think I just wanted to see how I could kind of change that and do it for myself, you know, and, and also have more time with my family and, yeah, try and do all that kind of stuff really as well. And also, I think the other thing was, you know, I was starting to make my own work again and doing all of that stuff. So I, I just felt like the time was right. Like I felt like I just, and weirdly enough, I think also that that label that I worked at, you know, they 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 do employ people with a spirit of independence. Uh, certainly, at that, uh, you know, I, I think that was a common denominator within that company, which which is amazing. It can be really difficult at times because. You know, there's a lot of different opinions and a lot of different people pulling in different ways. But it is great to work with so many people that are quite kind of like, you know, they have a level of independent thought. So people leave the company because of that, though, as well. If you if you have someone that's kind of got an independent spirit, you can't necessarily kind of uh, keep that for too long. <laughs> Does it feel more personal now in some ways that like the connections that you're having with people when you're working on it, if it's coming from like what you were saying you know someone will notice your work and then get in touch is that different to it just kind of coming through the label yeah and i think you kind of it means that you can kind of yeah you're approaching work in a more kind of sometimes in a more equal way like occasionally at island you would be you know working on a project because you were the person at the company that worked on the project and i'm not saying that's a bad thing but like you know perhaps the manager and the artist you know you don't have a level of connection or you know there's a level of like service provision, if you know what I mean, rather than just like artistic provision. And I think that's certainly changed for, for, for me in terms of like when artists and myself get in touch already. I also have a lot more, I can be a lot franker with artists, I think, than I previously could. Um, just because, you know, you're aware that you don't want to like rubbish anyone else in the company or say something that maybe someone else has promised or hasn't promised, you know, like you have to be mindful of, of, of the situation amongst your colleagues but I think now I can certainly be a lot more frank when it comes to you know I I don't necessarily you know I obviously look at the entire campaign in terms of like the visual world that I'm making and the kind of marketing thing that I'm doing alongside the kind of artistic side of it but I don't necessarily have to consider other parts of the process or whether or not you know if I say like oh you know like yeah maybe we should like you know go and shoot this day you know that's that's a logistical decision rather than like a decision which like means that like I've taken up someone's time at radio. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Where someone else is like, what have you done? You know, so so yeah, I, I certainly think it's a different approach. And yeah, I think it also is a different approach when someone approaches you, you know, someone wants to work with you then. And that's that's a really different thing to to you know, I'm not saying the people at Ireland didn't want to work with me. I, you know, probably had the most creative, fruitful relationship with any artist that, you know. I've worked with in terms of a artist called Sigrid through Ireland, through the fact that we kind of her project and my career, artistic career, collided at a time where we were both at a similar level and we both did things together. And it's been, you know, it's taken me and her places that I think, you know, would never have been in our wildest dreams. But, you know. It's always nice when you're developing in tandem with someone, isn't it? 
Yeah, that is very special. It's very special, and it doesn't come a, it doesn't come along too often. You know, that is something that is you know you will that, that I will personally not only are kind of artistically cherish for 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 the rest of my life. You seem to be doing a lot more kind of different stuff as well. I mean, you you know, you're mentioning Sigurd. There, you did a was it a jacket not too long ago. Oh yeah, like yeah it's kind yeah, of it's branching yeah, yeah. into everything. You know, it's not just about the artwork now. It's kind of the whole kind of aesthetic. I mean, I think that's always been my vibe. Really, is is is. I don't, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like I don't really try and limit myself, if you know what I mean. Like I, you know, obviously the things I'm often commissioned to do is, you know, create the album cover and the kind of campaign collateral around that and the brand of the record and the brand identity of how the marketeers are going to, you know, make the billboard and all that kind of stuff. But I'm quite greedy in my creative pursuits. And, you know, if I'm like, okay, like let's make a video or let's do this or let's, commission this photographer or let's go and work with this person or let's design a jacket or if if it's there i'll do it because i'm excited it gets me excited it's interesting it's engaging it's um it's fun you know it's like i'd never designed a jacket before i never designed an all-purpose all-terrain skiing jacket with a company a norwegian company i'm like oh can we do this no because that'll let the water in it's like wow that's brilliant that's that's amazing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very practical it suddenly becomes a kind of real tangible thing yeah and it's about uh, learning another craft skill isn't it it's about being able to like suddenly learn a whole new skill, set of skills and be like okay so like we want a load of patches on it but we can't sew them because it will make a hole so like can we use this velcro no the velcro is not good in the snow or like blah 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 you know so it's like that was so exciting you know and it's just a it was a smallish thing for, for her kind of career in terms of like you know it was a kind of brand thing you know in norway and stuff but you know it is it was also important for her because you know like she's like a real outdoorsy kind of person and those jackets are like part of a norwegian heritage and like you know that was just nice to be able to connect with an artist in a different way do you know what i mean like rather than just be like oh what do you want to do for this artwork you know it meant that we could like you know all the jackets had like recreation copies of her like name tags that like you know like her mum used to sew into her jumpers at school and stuff like that you know and the colors are the same color as like one that her granddad used to have and you know but they're like you just connect in ways that are quite profound about something that you just never would think would do that you know i mean that gives it a real authenticity as well doesn't it when you're kind of incorporating those tiny real world details into it people feel yeah man i that's what you want like i my my job is not to invent things you know like it's just to like help it's just to like bring stuff out of people and help them talk about themselves you know i I think the minute you're trying to invent something about someone or something or art trying to you know pretend not be honest in your art i think i think you're knackered because people just sniff it man they just they just you just tell it a mile off do you ever think differently about your artwork when you you know, we're speaking about all the kind of different sides that when you see it in a different setting, like say you see it on a bus poster, you see it on a billboard, or you see it like on a tangible actual record sleeve, does it ever kind of change yeah. the way you feel? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Like um, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. You know, sometimes if I see it massive on a poster, I think, fucking hell, I've s- all that type is set completely wrong. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, like sometimes seeing it massive, like really is a massive dent your ego dent to your ego rather than a big thing and like i know that sounds like the fucking biggest like you know first world problem in the world you know what i mean but you know it's you know oh poor me i saw it on on this or whatever you know it's but you know no but but like it does also change it like i think i think the thing that i love the most is 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 merchandise and you know going to a show and seeing you know a hundred people wearing a t-shirt you designed or seeing you know people after the show going and buying a poster that you designed or posting about it on Instagram, you know, the thing where people get the vinyl and post the vinyl and the artwork on Instagram or put it up on their wall or something. I mean, fucking hell, man. Like it's like a fucking privilege. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It blows my mind and it makes me feel uh, emotion, really emotional. (laughs) It becomes part of people's lives at that point, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, I know that I'm unseen in it and I'm not known in it and I'm fine with that, you know, because I don't know, it just makes you feel like you've done something good. You know, I know that sounds horrible and cheesy, but it just makes you feel like there's so much shit in the world, (laughs) you know, and so much bollocks and just that someone like gets something and likes it 
and it makes them feel good about themselves or about the world for a little bit or makes them think about something in a different way. I mean, that's just like, that's, that's, that's the, that's winning the lottery, isn't it, man? It's like, that's incredible. It's, and, and I feel really blessed and thankful that I, 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 I am somehow in the, in the position and the opportunity to like do that, you know, like someone, someone's deemed it okay that I can do that. <laughs> like, fucking hell, how's that? <laughs>